Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's Product School webinar. Thanks for joining us today. Just in case you didn't know, Product School teaches product management, coding, data analytics, digital marketing, and blockchain courses online and at our 15 campuses around the world. On top of that, every week we offer some amazing local product management events and host online webinars, live streams, and Ask Me Anything sessions. Head over to productschool.com after this webinar to check them out. Today, we have an awesome guest presenting. I'd like to introduce you to Sachin Agarwal. Sachin is a senior product manager and marketing leader with experience in B2B, B2C, marketplaces, and developer tools. He also has experience as a founder at two startups and early employee at three others. Before moving into product, his prior life was in venture capital, investment banking, and alternative investment management. Feel free to leave any questions for Sachin in the comments of Facebook, and I'll ask him them at the end. Without further ado, let's welcome Sachin. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. This is uh, fun for me, and uh, hopefully it'll be fun for everyone else uh, uh, joining us. So let me just share my screen, and let's keep going. So hopefully everyone can see my screen okay. Um, Looks good. All right. So just a quick thing, uh, I'm currently principal product manager at LaunchDarkly. LaunchDarkly provides feature flags as a service um, and a feature management platform. So this is incredibly helpful for software teams of all you know, shapes and sizes. Um, you know, we have, the people who know software best use us to power their software. So companies like Atlassian, Microsoft, and Vision, um, Intuit, you know, go on and on, or some of our over 500 customers. I also uh, run a conference called Empower. Empower is a conference just for B2B product managers, founders, and investors. Uh, we had our most recent conference in November, and you can see all the videos from Empower at empowerb2b.com. Um, and then third, as any good PM does, I have a side project, it's called Braid, which is a way to save and share information, both for yourself and with others, uh, through a Chrome extension built inside of Gmail and GCal. If you want to take a look at that and send me uh, Rotten Tomatoes, you can see that at braidhqs.com. So let's go through some baseline assumptions uh, for this presentation um, that I want to make sure that everyone kind of agrees with and then we can get into things. So first off, product, uh, product managers uh, are solving problems. They are not dictating solutions. Um, the, the role of a product manager is to fall in love with a problem, fall in love with the user, fall in love with a customer, fall in love with just the problems that those people have and then work with engineering, design, data to essentially go through the diverge and converge project process of figuring out multiple possible solutions to that problem and then choosing and implementing the right one. Oftentimes the best solution isn't a technical one. Sometimes process, documentation, copy, or even saying we're not gonna do it is the right thing. You know, a product manager to be good must prioritize ruthlessly. And that's really, really important. So not every solution defaults to having an engineering one. And the last one is PMs are force multipliers. You know, we are servant leaders. We, we, our job is to enable engineers and designers and data people to do their best work. And at the enterprise or B2B, it's also to enable the go-to-market team, the salespeople, the customer success people, the marketers, sales enablement and things like that. So again, a PM doesn't really do anything. We help other people do their jobs better. Today's problem that we had um, set up is you know, kind of how to create new products. And this is what we put on the webinar and going through all of that stuff. Um, and so I just want to make sure the three things that you know, we're going to talk, cover today are you know, how we test new product ideas, you know, this concept of money ball for product development, which I'll get into, and then writing user stories and specification documents. They're all very different, but they'll have a common theme we'll get into. Real quick, because this is jargony, money ball for product development refers to, uh, there was a book by Michael Lewis, who's an author who lives in Berkeley, around the Oakland A's. And Moneyball is essentially, the, the Oakland A's are a small market team. They don't have as, as much money as other teams. And the way that they competed was finding undervalued baseball players that the market looked at, you know, and undervalued because they were looking at different statistics. You know, one of the things that's really important as a PM is to make sure that we're looking for the things that are the most important. So I just wanna, when I use the term Moneyball, that's what I'm talking about, is making sure that you're looking at the right statistics, you're looking at the right metrics that really solve for the things that you're looking at. So what do these three things have in common? Why are these three things important as building new products? And how can we do them better? What we need to be able to do from, you know, I'm proposing for this uh, webinar is you need to be able to define objective measures. 
objective measures to measure new product ideas, objective measures to really make sure that you're solving for the right problems and you're measuring what you're doing, and then objective measures to really make your user stories and specification documents better. So the value of objective measures is that you don't build for the wrong problem. You can test things cheaply or easily. For Moneyball, you really want to find high value, low effort projects. As I said before, product management is a ruthless prioritization game. Your job is to help other people spend their time and energy as wisely as possible. That means delivering as much value to whoever you're solving for, whether it's the customer, a user type, a different type of user, solving for technical stuff, solving for an organization, whatever you're solving for, making sure you're delivering as much value with as low effort as you can. And then again, you know, how can you use objective measures for user stories and specs? It's really about holding yourself and your team accountable. And so that's what I want to get into. The reason I call this gambling is because you're placing bets of other people's time and effort. Again, PMs are there to enable other people. They're there to support other folks. We don't do any of the hard work ourselves, right? And so you have to get it right because you're asking other people through their effort, through their labor, through their time to prove you right in the decisions, the ruthless prioritization that you do. All right, and if you're gonna have them spend their time, you have to involve them in the process. It is not, not fair to ask people to do things, you know, and just lay it on them. You really need to have them involved in the whole process. And you wanna make sure that the information gathering time doesn't go on and on and on and on. You know, other people's time is very expensive, it's very valuable. And if you're involving them as you should, you need to be able to make decisions quickly by getting the right information and processing it as shortly as possible. And then you have to make a decision quickly. Time is value. So when you gamble, when you make a bet, these are all the things you're doing, whether you're at the poker table, whether you're at uh, the betting window and, you know, for sports, whether you're at uh, blackjack, any sorts of things you have gambling with, you can affect the odds. You know, you're doing information gathering and synthesis very, very quickly. And you are saying, I believe that this outcome is more likely to happen than some other outcome. And you're putting a monetary value behind that. Okay, objective measures are important generically because they really help keep us honest. It's impossible to backfit explanations if you have objective measures that you've defined up front. You can't go out hunting. It enforces precision up front. You can't be loosey goosey about your definitions about what's important. Objective measures is I believe this is going to increase by 3% in the next 30 days and we're gonna measure it. And you say that up front. You're stating your belief up front. And it's a forcing function for team alignment. You know, objective measures are a thing where like, hey, we want to solve this problem. How are we going to measure that we've solved it or not? You have to not only agree on the problem, but also agree on the metric that you're having for it. So again, when you, if you can't backfit explanations, you can't, you know, you can search for things that matches your, your priors, your feelings, your hunches, and you search for things, and that's not good. You need to say upfront and say, this is what would back me up, and this is what I would do if I were failing. It holds you accountable. And again, the precision upfront is really important. Saying that we're going to measure something in this way forces you to instrument that you can measure that thing before you do it. So measure that thing, have a baseline before you start doing the work on how you're going to change that measure, which is the whole point of building a new product. And again, you know, everyone needs to know what that goal is, not just the problem, but how we are going to measure ourselves and hold ourselves accountable. So what makes a legitimate objective measure? Well, it has to be numeric. It has to be a number. Um, one of the things, you know, if those of you who have done people management or had good one-on-ones with managers, you may recognize this from OKRs, when you have objectives and key results. Key results are the things that you measure. They have to be stated in advance. They have to be numeric. They can't be subject to interpretation. You can't be like, oh, I think looking at the same information, you can't have two different interpretations. It has to be completely cut and dry, you know, as to whether or not you've hit that measure or not. And that objective measure should be the best representation of success. So don't accept a measure because you already have close enough data. The best example of this is, oh, we have a mixed panel event or we have an amplitude event that sort of talks about this, so we'll optimize for that. No, you need to instrument the absolute best way because that matches the measure to the problem that you were trying to solve. And so if you, if you have to do engineering work or you have to instrument other things in mixed panel, or in amplitude or using segment or whatever else you're doing, then do that first. Don't rely on the things that you already have on hand. And usage of the thing you're proposing to build is a terrible objective measure. I would 100% fire you for suggesting this. The reason this is terrible is that is solution dependent. 
right? What it's saying is, again, you're falling in love with problems, and every problem has multiple possible solutions. If you're only measuring usage of the thing you built, then you're solution dependent, and you're not solving the problem. And so th this, is, this is a pet peeve of mine, and I hope that it becomes a pet peeve of yours. Do not do that. Make sure that you are solving a problem and that the measure of solving that problem is something outside usage of the feature that you're building. Okay, so let's talk about where these objective measures come from for each of these three types. For testing new product ideas, the user needs to define the objective measure because the user or the company or whoever you're solving for, I'm using the shorthand user, is a person who can tell you what that measure is, okay? Moneyball for product development, for finding like high value, low effort stuff, the organization needs to define that. And I'll get into which parts of the organization do that. And then for user stories and spec docs, the metrics in terms of how we're proving that we've solved that problem are the objective measure. So this kind of feels like, you know, the snake eating its own tail. We'll get into why it's a little bit different. So for new product ideas, you've got a bunch of new product ideas. The user defines the objective measure, right? And the way that you have that is the user defines which problems are the most important. One of the things you may have heard is that users really know their problems, but they don't have a really good sense of solutions. Um, one of the things that you'll hear me say um, is that feature requests are not really feature requests, they're just differently stated problem statements. They're different ways of, when a user says, I wish you would build X feature, what they're saying is I wish you would solve Y problem. And I believe that you can do it, and this is my suggestion. You have to go back a little bit and really understand the problem. Again, a good PM falls in love with a problem, not a solution. And then what you want to be able to do to help you and your team out is to exaggerate those differences. And you want to incentivize the user, the customer, whoever you're solving for, to exaggerate the differences, essentially make it easier for you to do that prioritization exercise. And so my best objective measure for your product ideas is a $100 test. What you do to do a $100 test is very simple. You give the user post-its and Sharpie, and they write down all the problems they currently have on each one of these post-its. So you can imagine that if you're built, you know, if you're interested in productivity, it'd be like, I don't, I have issues with what am I supposed to work on? I have issues with communicating progress to other people. I have issues, you know, making sure that other people who I'm working with are also working on, right. like, you can just go through all of that sort of stuff. And, and sometimes they already have solutions to those things. Sometimes they don't have any solution at all. Sometimes they have a solution that is solving that problem and they're very happy with it. You should write down all of these things and have the user do that. Ask them, what do you wish was better for each one of those things? So how big is this problem? And give them $101 bills and tell them to spend that $100. On the table or on the wall or however you've got these post-its, put those $100 into the right places. Now what will end up happening is they, the user will not want to hurt your feelings. And what they'll do is they'll end up equal weighting everything. So say, this one is $20, and this one's $20, and this one's 19 and this one's 19 and this one's like 22 right? So you can say, oh, the 22 is more important than like the 20 or the 19, but it really may not be. So you'll ask the user, okay, well, I think the $19 one is really easy to solve. If I did that one first, how upset would you be? And essentially what you want to do is get them to go through and really exaggerate those differences. And so what you want them to do is to be strategic. You're like, look, if you tell me all the things are roughly equivalent and 19, 20, and 22 are roughly equivalent, then you're saying all of them are the same to you. Is that really what you mean? And then have them respend the $100. Have them exaggerate the differences. Ideally, one of those things is going to have the majority of the money. One of those things can have $51 or more. And then you can hone in on that is the right problem to solve. And then you can go through the exercise of how much effort it is. But really what you want to do is find the right problems and stack rank them and have those differences. Right? So you know, something that's number one and number two, if number one and number two are like this, it's very different than if number one's here and number two is here. Because if number one and number two are truly like this, then you really have to scope out from a project planning perspective how much effort solving one and solving two as good as you can are. Whereas it's here and here, then you really need to find a way to solve this problem regardless of how much effort it is because that's where you're delivering value. And here's the note is if this is really hard to build and this is a really big problem and number two is down here, you should charge more. All right. So, for Moneyball for Product Development, this is where we're talking about finding the high value, low effort stuff. So organization defines the objective measure. 
you want to measure those goals, right? Like let's figure out like, hey, we want to deliver value to the user, deliver value to the customer. We want to measure how we're doing that. And you need to identify the organization's strengths and weaknesses. And this is where you have to bring in your designers and your engineers in particular as part of this process. And so what you want to do, you know, this is essentially number two, is you want to back solve into, into defining the problems with cheap solutions. So if you ask people up front, hey, I've got these three problems I want to solve. How hard is it to solve them? People won't give you great answers. What you really want to do is get alignment on organizational goals first. Like for this organization, we want to increase our revenue by solving these problems and you know, getting more customers or charging our existing customers. Like whatever that is, however you want to do it, get that alignment first. Then you ask the team to brainstorm solutions to all of these three pro problems, okay? Then you ask them which problems those solutions match, right? Because people will be like, oh, we should build X, we should build Y, we should build Z, we should do that. You need to go back and think about, hey, this solution really matches these two problems. Maybe it only matches one problem. Maybe you know, none of them really fully match. We need to do, we need to build X, Y, and Z to fully solve problem one. Right? You need to go through and like go backwards and do that. And so circle back and ask the team, hey, all right, we've talked about ideal solutions to these problems. What's 80%? Where can we find the thing that like, oh, if we did that, or like we said actively no to like solving for this user or solving for this edge case or solving for latency or like whatever the thing is that we're willing to drop on the table, ask them for 80% solutions to those problems. Almost always, you'll have a eureka moment where they'll be like, you know what, we can get 80% of that value in one week by de-scoping in this particular way. And engineers know what the level of effort is. They get to decide what the thing is that wins because you can figure out the value. That's your job as a PM. But engineers and designers, the only ones who can really dictate effort, right? As a PM, especially if, a PM, if you've been doing it for a long time or if you're a PM in particular with an engineering background, you can guess at it but you should never impose and say, I think that's easy. I think that's medium effort. I think that's hard effort. You should never say that. You should never think that. The engineering leads, the design leads, the people who are building the thing to solve the problem get to decide how much work it is. And so you ask them to do that. So let's talk about the last one, which is user stories and specification documents. Again, we're talking about finding objective measures. So you write better user stories, write better specs to make sure that once you've decided that we're gonna solve this problem, once you've decided on a solution path, making sure that we're keeping ourselves honest and we're building the best thing. So you've decided what problem to tackle. You need to define the success measure that matches that problem, right? And so what I do is in my spec documents, I always have a place where I define the problem statement, I, def I define a solution hypothesis, and I define a success metric. So the problem statement is, who are you solving for? Are we solving for the user? Oftentimes there are different kinds of users. There are expert users, novice users, admin users, you know, all sorts of different kinds. Who are you solving for? Maybe it's multiple of them. And what is the shared problem they all have? Don't solve multiple problems at once with the same solution, unless you've gone through the exercise of making sure that that solution is the best possible way to solve each of those problems. And then which solution did you pick, right? Every problem has multiple solutions, every problem. There's no, there's only one way to solve this. Anything you work on always has multiple solutions. And so state up front, this is the solution we picked. And if you need to early on in like as a forcing function, state up front the solutions we chose not to do, right? It's really, really, really important. And then the success metric is again, what's the numerical objective thing that you're watching? What is that key result? What is that success metric that defines solving the problem, not usage of the solution? Again, we're in the problem solving business. We're here to make our users, our customers' lives easier. We're here to like reduce the costs you know, for us to deliver the service. We're here to like increase revenue. Whatever the thing is, whatever the problem is, like that's what's important and we need to have that measure. The solution is just the path that we've chosen to get there. And that path is one of many paths. So in conclusion, you know, what you want to do is use objective metrics because they're magic bullets. They're forcing functions, they get alignment, they allow you to avoid, well, you know, hunting for data, you know, to match the, the feeling that you already have. And again, who defines the objective measure? For new product ideas, the user does through the $100 test. For Moneyball, for high value, low effort stuff, the engineering design team defines the objective measure. And for rising user stories and spec docs, it's you, the PM, 
define that metric for that objective metric. You define what that solution is and if you need, or excuse me, what that metric is to make sure that you've solved that problem, not usage of the solution. And that's your job as a PM to do that. And as I said earlier, make sure that you instrument accurately and pick the best possible objective measure for any of these. But in particular, once you've decided to go for it and build the thing, make sure you've instrumented properly and you don't just take what's easy to get a hold of. So I ran through this a little quickly because I really wanted to hear some of your questions. Hey there, thank you for that awesome presentation. I do have just one question for you now, but I think some people might start posting them as you answer this one. Let me find it quick. Um, what are the best practices to evaluate which objectives metrics to measure as the product evolves from MVP to full-fledged product market fit? Right, so they shouldn't change, right? And the reason they shouldn't change is like, an MVP is like, I think people focus too much on the minimum, not the viable, right? Like what you wanna be able to do is like, you should have core metrics around things that correlate to revenue or correlate to usage or like whatever your business model is, right? Like you should know upfront how it is you're going to both deliver value and capture value. And you should have some sense of that. And that's why, you know, product is often in charge or should be in charge of pricing and packaging decisions. Because what your job is to not just deliver value, but it's also to capture some of that value. Um, I have a blog post that I, read, that I wrote about this recently. And so that, as long as you're not hitting diminishing returns, that metric should stay the same. And so being ruthless and understanding what that metric is upfront and optimizing for that until you hit diminishing returns where like solving this problem is no longer important, then you're choosing another problem, that's when you should do it. But oftentimes you'll have these core KPIs and those can persist across multiple, you know, multiple projects, frankly, even multiple products, you know, Obviously, you know, a product is a collection of features, a company is a collection of products. You know, you may have that same KPI for decades. Awesome, thank you for that. Um, I have one other question here. It's how to define whether your idea is good or not. For instance, I'd like to create a smart frame. Okay, so let's go through it. A smart frame is an interesting idea. You know, one, you have to define smart and all the rest of it, but go back to the problems. What's the problem that smart frame is trying to, is, is solving? Start with the user. What are the problems that they have? So, you know, is it, oh, you know, it's too hard to change the pictures in the frames I have around. Is it, you know, getting frames up and down off the wall, you know, makes that hard for me to want to do it. Like, what's the thing, what's the thing that you're solving for? Like, what's the real pain point? And then figure out the value. So like, oh, if I could really see the best pictures, you know, I would feel happier because it would get, bring back these memories, right? You know, and you know, go through it. Like, what are other solutions to that problem? Well, buy multiple frames and put up multiple pictures. Well, maybe I've, you know, you know, and then you'll understand, oh, I have a small apartment. I don't have room for all these frames, all the rest of it. That'll tell you something about the user and how big that problem is to them, right? So if you know, the idea is like, I want to see the most up-to-date pictures, a smart frame is one possible solution to that. Another thing is to like hire someone on, Craigslist or TaskRabbit to like swap out your pictures. Another solution is to like buy more frames and put them up. Like making sure that you understand what the problem is, what the other solutions are, rather than be prescriptive about the solution you're excited about and backfilling into the problem you're trying to solve. Awesome, thank you. And another question, this one's a bit longer. What is your advice on dealing with internal stakeholders? In our startup, we have a founder with a very strong opinion on how clients' needs, needs need to be solved, which I am the product manager don't agree with, and also the data doesn't agree as well. That's tough, right? Um, I mean, one of the things is the, the exercise, the question is, and having the ability to deliver this question is, is hard, right? So the question is, what information would you need upfront to change your mind? That's the question you should ask that CEO has a very strong solution hypothesis to things, right? That's what I'm hearing. And if that person can't say what would objectively change their mind, if they can't agree with you on that key result, on that objective success metric, right? Then you're in a position where you're just a feature factory. And, you know, that's tough. 
But if that founder is really dedicated to the success of the company and is willing to give up some of that, now again, like a good founder, a good PM should have product instincts, should really understand the problem, should have huge empathy for whoever you're solving for. Like, you know, often they can be more, you know, more often they can be right than wrong. That's great. But you should be able to define that success measure upon. So I would go back and try to find the right way to ask you know, something similar to like, what information would you need to change your mind? Agree on what that information looks like, make it as precise as possible, make it as objective as possible, and then you can go back and you know, try different things against it. That's the way I would frame that conversation. But in any startup, being the first PM or an early PM where the founder has a very strong product vision, it's a very, it's a tough job, right? Being the first PM at a company is really, really hard. So hats off to you. Awesome, thank you. I've got another one here from Paulina. You can't do it. You can't do a hundred dollar test with 10 million users. What would you suggest in that case? Right, so there are different ways of getting information, right? So if you've got 10 million users, obviously you've got scale and all the rest of it. You know, one, you should still bring in users and meet them. Either ideally you go to them into the place where they work or the place where they live, or the place where they you know, socialize, wherever they're using your application in the wild, go to them and do some of those visits with folks. You know, CPG companies, you know, Procter & Gamble's Unilever's where they're selling toothpaste and soap, you know, Coca-Cola, all the rest of them, they have millions of people, they still, they still do focus groups, they still do, you know, home visits, they still do one-on-one -on -one user interviews. There's no reason not to do that. So when you do that, you can do the $100 test. But in addition to that, if you're lucky enough to be at scale, you can run A-B tests, you can run split tests. You know, feature flags are a great way to do that. You know, thanks for the plug. Um, to go through and, and really see what's going on. You can look at the data, see, you know, what things correlate, but you should still also do these things even when you have that sort of scale. Awesome. And from the same question, uh, Asker, how do you balance out user requests slash needs and strategic goals for innovative products? It's tough and it's interesting, right? So user requests, again, as I said before, feature requests are just restated problem statements, right? When someone says, oh, I wish I had this feature, what they're saying is I have this problem and I think this feature that I think one, you can solve it. That's why they make the feature request. And two, this is what their implementation. Sometimes it's right, but what you want to do is figure out that problem. And then from your perspective, how valuable is it to solve that problem and how much effort would it be? So again, going through that money ball exercise of identifying the high value, low effort stuff is where that comes out. And so if you have strategic priorities around, we need to increase revenue from existing company, existing customers is very different than increasing revenue from new customers, right? If you're trying to increase revenue from existing customers, you know, for whatever reason, maybe customer acquisition costs have gone crazy. And so like, you really need to monetize your existing user base more. You're not gonna spend time on like, you know, onboarding or things like that. But what you are gonna do is give the existing features that people are already using more bells and whistles. And so really it comes, it really falls through naturally if you're honest with yourself about what your goals are and the things that you have available to you to meet those goals. So, you, you know, when you, you know, a really bad example is like, oh, we need to increase revenue 3%, you know, 300%, we need to triple our revenue. Well, how are you going to do that? Everything. We're going to get more money from existing customers and new customers. Well, that's not being honest. Like pick one, like which is more valuable, which is easier to get that value from, right? You're creating value and you have to capture it. So going through these prioritization exercises, thinking about these sorts of things and thinking about you know, what opportunities you have given the resources you have. Like if you're very good at design, you can design stuff better. If you're very good at engineering, you know, maybe you can build new things. Like you just have to go through that process of like really identifying from the user how valuable it is to solve that problem that that feature request is and if it aligns with your goals and your strategic objectives. And frankly, your limitations because every company has limitations. Awesome, thank you so much. I think that concludes all of our questions. I don't see any more here. So uh, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Awesome webinar, it was a pleasure having you. Thanks for uh, having me, it's been fun. Great, so uh, before we leave, uh, I wanted to give you guys all some information on our courses and upcoming events. So you have the resources to become a product manager. Um, our product management, coding, data analytics, digital marketing, digital marketing, 
and blockchain courses are taught by industry experts working at companies like Google and Facebook. And in addition to that, we offer weekly online and on-site events at our 15 campuses across the US, UK, and Canada. So if you're located near campus, make sure you stop by for one of our weekly events every Wednesday and Thursday. And you can also find us on social media at Product School. And be sure to keep up with the latest product management content at the product blog at productschool.com. Thank you all for joining. Enjoy the rest of your day. And I hope you I hope to see you next week. Have a great day, Sachin. Later.